Welcome to the NHL Wraparound Podcast, featuring Neil Smith, President, General Manager of the 1994 Stanley Cup champion New York Rangers, and longtime ESPN NHL veteran Vic Morin. Together, they share no-nonsense opinions on news and issues around the National Hockey League. Whether you're a casual or diehard fan, each episode of NHL Wraparound will leave you more informed. Now, here's your hosts, Neil and Vic. Welcome to NHL Wraparound. We're recording on Monday, the 11th of November, and that means it is Veterans Day in the United States, Remembrance Day in Canada, and for all those who have served, are serving, and will serve, you are appreciated for defending freedom. And I know this uh, means a lot to us, Neil, because your parents, Marg and Sid, served in the Canadian Navy. And my dad, Michelle, or Mickey, as he is known, served in the United States Air Force. And I think that uh, we were speaking about this yesterday, that when you're brought up by World War II parents, uh, you know, it's a it, it's a different life you lead after that than if you're brought up by, for example, the Vietnam era parents. Uh, everything changes over these decades and very interesting to see. But I'm very proud, as I know you are, of uh, my parents and their time uh, in putting themselves in harm's way many, many times, uh, but luckily came out of it unscathed. And I proudly have an American flag as uh, my dad passed in 2016. So uh, certainly uh, a day that we should all be grateful for the freedoms that we do have. Coming up on our show today, we are pretty loaded and we have uh, Tom Fitzgerald, the general manager and president of hockey operations for the New Jersey Devils joining us. We're also going to have a lot of league notes. Uh, We're going to talk about a lot of sizzle and not steak, Uh, a very significant NCAA eligibility ruling coming up as it pertains to the CHL and the human side of the story will touch on the Hockey Hall of Fame inductions, those that are getting in and those who have been omitted. But first, three things you need to pay attention to. And Neil, you tired of talking about the Winnipeg Jets yet? No, I'm not going to get tired of them because the aforementioned Mark Smith uh, is from Winnipeg, Manitoba, and so it's always fun to talk about the Jets. Well, let's go into the real pluses, because there's no minuses to talk about with this team. The first team in history to open up a season 14-1. and one. They took care of Dallas very easily on Saturday afternoon, 4-1. to one. Connor Hellebuck uh, almost had his third straight shutout. The streak ended at 191-47. The power play first in the league, 41.9%. And if you want to know how good things are going in Winnipeg, I'm going to invite fans to look at the first goal of that game, a power play goal by the second unit. And this is eight seconds worth of video that begins off a rebound. It is bookended by Alex uh, Iafalo. And all five players touch the puck, the puck movement, the player movement, six passes in eight seconds, and it was art. And to me, that just completely symbolized everything that's going right with the Winnipeg Jets right now. And and they're flying high, and no pun intended there, but they are uh, uh, clicking on all cylinders. And you know, when you're winning and you're happy in your locker room, and your goaltending is great, and everything, everything just seems to click. And you're right about that goal against Dallas. This against the Dallas Stars. It's not against San Jose Sharks. Uh, it's against Dallas. And they, as you said. Click, 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 click in the net. And uh, that was the second power play unit, as you mentioned. Um, Quite a thing to see. Any chance you get people to see the Winnipeg Jets, I suggest you tune it in. And they will be in Madison Square Garden on Tuesday evening as they kick off a rather challenging road trip that will see them play in New York, in Tampa, in Florida, and then return home. To, pay, uh, to face the defending cup champions a second time. So certainly a good acid test coming up for the Winnipeg Jets. Number two, 
Alex Ovechkin. Now up to 10 goals, 863 for his career, 31 back of Wayne Gretzky. He is projecting 59 this season, and you could just see the complete rejuvenation that he has had. His energy is phenomenal. He's playmaking. He's He's been effective on both sides of the puck this year, and I think he has defied a lot of experts with the start that he has had. Oh, absolutely. Well, he's defied his age. I mean, let's face it, he's born in 1986. And by my math, that makes you 38. <laughs> and uh, this year at some point. And, uh, so he's playing great. And, and, but I, what I think it is, uh, Vic, I think it's he and being rejuvenated by the chant, by the thought that he knows he can win. Meaning they're a playoff team. They're playing like a playoff team. They're playing like a competitive team every night. They're not squeaking by. He doesn't look in the locker room and go, oh, my God, how are we going to win tonight? He knows they got a chance to win each and every night. And I think that incentivizes Alex and he's playing really good. I think also the balance of scoring that this team has had this year with Strom and McMichael and just so many contributors this season is it's refreshing for him that the onus isn't entirely on his shoulders. Absolutely. No, that's true. And uh, he'd, he'd last year when he was pretty slow in scoring goals at the beginning, it was, it was almost like, you know, he was looking around going, I'm, I'm going to have to carry this whole thing. I can't carry this whole thing. Uh, but this year he looks like he's having fun, like you said, and, and, and good on him. And let's see where this goes. Number three, Neil is something that started a disturbing trend with Lane Lambert behind the New York Islanders bench last year, continuing with Patrick Waugh. And that is blown leads late in game, the most recent coming on Saturday evening where the Islanders had a two-goal lead against New Jersey with under five minutes left, wound up losing that lead with the goalie pulled and then falling in overtime. And this is a situation that we know that the club is really banged up both uh, up front and particularly defensively, but this is almost a psyche thing at this point with them, isn't it? I, I think so. And particularly when you look at the stats, the, the, the stats don't lie. Um, you know, 14 leads in their first 15 games. That means, if, you know, there's only been one game where they haven't at some point had the lead. Um, it, it does become a psychological issue of, you know, oh, I'm nervous again. Can we hold the lead? And I think the only way to rectify it is for the coaches to find a system that battens it down and, and shuts down the other team. Uh, late in games, like you have a game plan of how you're going to shut somebody down, much the way that the uh, the old New Jersey Devils used to do it in the in the Jacques Lemaire days. Boy, if you if they got a lead on you, forget it. There, you could watch paint dry and have more fun. <laughs> <laughs> and that's often what it looked like. Uh, just to put a little bit more context on this, that the Islanders have already given up three goals to the opposition with the netminder pulled. The league average is, is, about, is about one and a half at this point in the season. Last year, they gave up seven goals when the opposition had their goalie pulled and the NHL average was only five and a half. So they've trended higher and that's not a good thing in each of the last two seasons. And last year, just to go back there one more time, they lost 23 games in which they had a lead at some point. So you mentioned before that they have had leads in 14 to 15 games and wound up losing three of them thus far this season. So as this club goes out on the road, they are certainly going to be tested because they've got a five-game road trip coming up to Edmonton, Vancouver, Seattle, Calgary, and Detroit. And it's going to be very interesting to see how this club plays as it goes forward on its first major road swing of the season. Yeah, and again, uh, there's nothing wrong with playing boring hockey on the road. You're not entertaining your home fans, so you can, you know, just get the points and get out of the building and move on to the next place. That's what you try to do when you're on the road is, you know, get in, and get your points and get out. And so the Islanders, again, they're going to have to find a way to shut down the other team when they get a lead, get boring, get just get disciplined and shut them down. And we've seen this around the league with clubs that have struggled, particularly in their own building, that when they get on the road, they simplify, they play more basic, and they wind up performing well. And we'll see if this holds true with the Islanders. 
Welcome back to NHL Wraparound. It's my pleasure to have Tom Fitzgerald, who's the president of hockey operations and the GM of the New Jersey Devils. And still, Tom, I, I have trouble thinking about you with New Jersey because all I see is a Panthers uniform. When I think of you, uh, because of all those times that we played against each other, I didn't play, but I had my team playing against you. And um, it just seems like yesterday. It doesn't seem like it was, what, 20, 28, 30 well, years ago you're, now. You're aging us now. You're, yeah. You're aging us. Yeah, it is. It is unique. It's different. Um, you know, I was I was an Islander. I got drafted by the Islanders. Um, <laughs> hated the Rangers. <laughs> Still either, you know, playing in Florida for a majority of my years and a lot of a lot of great games against the Rangers. And then to getting on the other side of my career, being with Pittsburgh and losing to the Rangers a couple of times in the playoffs and now being in New Jersey for 10th. It's my 10th year. Wow, it's gone by fast. Uh, oh, just the anxiety I get, uh, you know, playing the Rangers, you know, with half the stadium filled with blue shirts and <laughs> uh, just bruh. But you know what? That's hockey, and I, I I get I understand. And you were there for such a long time. I understand the lore of uh, New York. Um, it, it is incredible. Um, but when you were raised on one side of the island in, in, in your career, and then you're on the other side of the island, uh, Manhattan, that is uh, in New Jersey now. It, it is just a ugh. It was a very sweet two years ago when we beat them in the first round. I can tell you that. Oh yeah, I was I I was there, and that was a heck of a year. And you've had. Um, I, you know, I, I know in a little way what you're going through. Hopefully you have the same result as I'm going to talk about because in 92, uh, we won the president's trophy and we're, uh, you know, clicking on all cylinders. Messier won MVP. Um, unfortunately we lost in this second or third round of Pittsburgh. And then the next year we missed the playoffs and it was like, you go from, you ch- like you guys last year, you must, it's just such a kick in the head. And then now you've come back with a vengeance and you did a lot of great things in the summer and your team seems to be going. You got a real good coach. You got lucky, I think, in getting Sheldon Keefe because I think he should still be in Toronto. I think that's ridiculous. But anyway, we'll leave that for another day. But um, it's, it's, it's tough when you're GM and you go through that roller coaster ride, isn't it? It's extremely tough, Neil. You, you, like you said, you've done it. You've been there. The anxiety, the emotions, the stress levels, uh, the questions, why? You know, how do we get here? Last year, we probably could hang our hat on a couple things. You know, we, we you know, free agency is one thing. The K, there's a cap. Uh, you, you lose a couple of veteran defensemen to free agency. Uh, you know, they do, do higher pay. And, Couple of these guys, and then you have a couple of young players that you you real you feel really good about. But the other day, it's still the National Hockey League, and it's a men's league. And um, growing pains were there, and then injuries. You had injuries to key players, and uh, goaltending wasn't great. Um, or to be honest, it wasn't even good. Um, and we've gone through it's a, same, it's a similar scene uh, scene every year. It's a theme. It's just it was the same thing, and. Yeah, we had a checklist of things we wanted to accomplish. We knew our core was was strong. Well, we believe it, 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 it's it's strong um, and young. Um, so we wanted to build around those those edges and, and and really find find players that could come in and and, and really you know support th- those guys um, and also get a, a lot harder to play against and, and tougher, especially on the back end and and get bigger. So, um, but goaltending was probably the number one thing we needed to, to fix. It started at the deadline last year, acquiring right before the deadline, Jake Allen. And to be honest, we had to convince Jake to come to New Jersey because he had a no movement clause. Um, and we were on it. So uh, starting there and then the moves we made at the deadline to, to free up the position uh, in the summer, create some cap space that we could go out and get uh, uh, a number one goalie. And, and, and we did that in, in, in Jacob Markstrom. And, and not to mention Sheldon, you know, really, if you look back at the things we needed to check off, it was finding the right coach. Um, I was probably a little too patient for some people with the coaching uh, call and because uh, there were some really good coaches that were available. And But I always said I'm going to wait for the, the second round to start or the first round to end and, and see what falls through. And, yeah, we, we were lucky. And believe me, it was, it was a lot of convincing just for, to have him take the interview. Um, and really just teaching about who we were as an organization, what we have and 
the upside that we felt we we had uh, to convince Sheldon to to come down to New Jersey to actually just take a look and have dinner with you know myself and our owner and uh, thank God he took that invitation. To that end, Tom, you, we talked about, or you had spoken about, um, you know, the injuries and Dougie Hamilton's injury in November last year seemed to almost be the start of the slide for you guys. But Timo Meyer, who, who you had acquired uh, from San Jose, he was hurt. Jack Hughes was hurt. So now you've got everybody back healthy. But the pieces that you have filled in, in addition to Markstrom, Pesci, Dillon, Kovacevic on defense, Tatar, Nason, and Cotter up front. So when you take all of these parts, either coming back healthy or joining your team, and you add Sheldon Keefe, how does his structure or what he likes to see his team play, how do these players fit in and make this the perfect match for you guys? That's a great question. Uh, again, going back to the checklist of things we wanted to do, the, the characteristics of the players that we really wanted to add, um, work ethic, compete, uh, commitment, you know, guys who are committed to structure and committed to playing fast and working and getting on the four check, finishing your check, playing heavier, uh, being heavy out of the corners for defensemen, not allowing allowing your goalie to see shots from the point uh, versus tip goals that we've been given up and screens in the past. It, it, it's just they've they've really come in and complemented what we we've had. And again, it was it, it was a, a script we wanted to to stick with that, and and, and we did. The, the Cotters and you know make a move for a Cotter uh, for a high prospect like you know Alexander Holtz. It's just I'm just looking for the right fit. For our team today, um, and what we could, you know, what we have to what we didn't have, um, we wanted to add that speed. We wanted to add that heaviness. Paul Carter was, you know, top five in forward hits last year. Um, Dylan on the back end, always one of the leading hit hitters. And you can say like, ah, oh, hitting is, it's it's still part of the game. And there there is there's something to say to it that you know what you we're not going to be pushed around. Dougie last year, you're right. Like losing him and Jack and Timo, it, it was. You, <laughs> You, you can't. We don't have that forward depth. We didn't have it to, to fill in, and you can't. Any any team who loses players like that, you, you just you can't replace them. You just want to do it by committee, um, and that's what we've done. And Sheldon has been a huge part of that, convincing our guys that it, it's it's just not one player. It's 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 the entire team and how we play and how we go out and um, dictate play. And hey, listen, we've had our ups and downs this year. A lot of good. Um, you know, I think every game we've lost, we, we could have won, and that's something to be said. Uh, versus being blown out and learning how to win two to one or one nothing or three to one with them. Those are, those are the steps that each winning team and now you know that you, you've got to, one, you've got to be committed to it. You've got to want to do it. You've got to understand that it doesn't matter if you win eight nothing or one nothing. It's still a win. Um, and it's winning the right way. When you talk about building the team and Neil and I have spoken with several guests over our time doing the podcast. This is such a copycat league. And nobody knows that better than you for all the years that you have been around. And you take a look at Vegas a couple of years ago and you take a look at Florida and how they play in your face. They play a uh, very aggressive forecheck. And how much of that played into your decision making when you actually built this team for this season? Well, I, I'll, I'll throw in Pittsburgh. Like they're, they're a different team than those two teams. They were different than Washington, right? Like the, those, you know, Washington, the Vegas is the, the, the floor is big and heavy. I don't know how big and heavy Pittsburgh was, but they were fast and they were skilled. And to me, speed and skill kills when all things are equal, you know, the teams with the most skill, uh, and, 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 and a lot of speed, it, it just kills. If all things are equal, that's work ethic, that's compete on pucks, that's being fearless to get to the inside ice. Um, we have that. We have that skill. We have that speed. It was just the things we didn't have. So, I, I, yeah, it's a copycat league, but knowing what I want and what our organization wants, uh, what our team looked like, we weren't there. We're getting there. And when it comes to draft pick and, and things like that, we're – we're a ceiling organization. You know, let's get the guy with the most, the, the highest ceiling. But there's a part of it too. They're like, okay, not every kid hits it. Not every kid, you know, how, what's the percentage of kids hitting their ceiling? But what's their floor? 
Can they play in this league? Can they can they contribute at a high level? You know, what what are the things that they add to it? So, with that being said, we are fast. We've got a lot of skill. We're fantastic off the rush. Um, but when teams sit on top of us, can we grind it out? And we didn't have the players to do that. Now we do. Tom, uh, on a side note, we talked about your start with the Islanders. I don't know if you know this. Uh, you're younger than me, obviously. And, and I started with the Islanders, my, my management yeah. career. I knew that. Yeah. Yep. I knew and, that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is where it's going to relate back to you. So in 1982, I ran the New York Islanders Hockey School along with uh, Rich Torrey, Bill's son, Richard Torrey. And our camp counselor was Jimmy Hughes, <laughs> yeah. who uh, is the father yeah. of the great Jack and Luke Hughes that you have on your team. So if you want to feel old sometime, <laughs> stuff like that can really make you feel old. Well, I'll add to it. Jimmy and I were teammates at Providence College. So, yeah, and Lou Lamarello was our AD at the time, you know, before he left for New Jersey. So, yeah, get him now. We're outdating ourselves here. Not sure we should do that. I know, <laughs> I know. Uh, I just think I just think it's such a great story. And of course, now Jimmy works for Pat Brisson, who's a friend of mine from from way, way back. And uh, yeah, he's his family, uh, I, a great I, family. You know, Jimmy, Jimmy's dad is, is, is what a what a just a down to earth person. And we Jimmy and I hit it off right away because of our family background. You know, my dad and family being, you know, a longshoreman and, and, and fireman and, and Jimmy's dad being a fireman. So it, it was a it was an instant connection there for sure. Yeah, well, um, I just I just love that story. But I, I, I do want to ask you about one player that um, you have on your team that has had a rebirth in the league because I mentally had written him off at one time, and that's Dougie Hamilton. And he, he is so good for you guys. He had five shots on net last night. Uh, he sure and, and, and Jack Hughes each had eight. Uh, but, but getting back to Dougie Hamilton, I've watched his career. And at one point I was saying to Vic the other day, he, he was like, it's sort of like a Tom Pody, you know, like, I mean, you, you know, and now all of a sudden for you guys, he's a star player. Like he's a great offensive weapon that you guys have. And can I, just tell me about how did, how did that transformation come about? Cause I think it's since he's been with New Jersey that it's all happened. Well, you know what? I would say when we were on the hunt to, to help our organization out through free agency, and I, I have to give my ownership credit, David Butch and Josh Harris, because they're just like, listen, like it's time. It's time to, to go out and find these plays and spend money. So I, I thank them for pushing us that way to, to go out and find that guy. When you talk about right shot defensemen, like they don't grow on trees. You know, they're just, they're special out there and they're, they're almost like unicorns, right? Like you just, you have one, you hold on to it. And when he became a free agent, you know, we were looking for players that could help push the needle from the back end, um, especially offense. You know, he does an incredible amount of good on the offensive side. You know, he's one of the best, if not the best in the league. I'd, I'd put anybody up against him of getting his shots to the net. Um, you know, his, his, I don't want to call it his coursey or expected goal stuff, but when you look at it, it just, it, it just comes right off the table at you. And you're like, wow. Um, you know, where, you know, like everybody, everybody's got to work on things. And with Dougie, it's, it's play away from the puck. You know, it's, it's being harder and stronger and, and a little more, a little more, Oomph in, in checking in, in defending. Um, but when you had a guy like Brendan Dillon next to him, and Brendan could say to him, Dougie, no one's going to touch you and no one's going to hurt you. So I want you to go out and play like you're eight feet tall versus six, eight. Um, and be, be the, the king of the, the, the ice time because no one's going to touch you, Dougie. And, and I've, we've seen that transformation in Dougie playing harder and, and actually playing with, you know, a fearless, a fearless game because of what he has on his left side, uh, making sure he's 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 protected. Well, it, it, and earlier in his career, before New Jersey, uh, if he had gone down early in the season, nobody would have been saying about that organization. Well, they got no chance now that they lost Hamilton. But in your organization, as Vic mentioned earlier, that last season, that was such a big blow to you guys to lose him. It and, was. Uh, it's impressive. Yeah. You know what? We, we felt lucky. Actually, the domino effect of that was getting a sneak peek of Simone Nemich, our number two pick a few years back, who's been playing pro hockey since he was 16. So he's been in the American League at 18. As a 19-year-old, 
the plan wasn't to have him on our roster. It was to to have another solid year of growth in the American League. And um, and then this year probably would have been his his time. Um, but when you have to fast forward because of the injuries, uh, you got a sneak peek of it. And I remember saying to my owner after game eight, you know, this is game nine. And I said, we will be blowing through <laughs> his 10th game because of how well he's played. He was our best defenseman those first 10 games he played. And um you said, wow, we got a good player here. And then a 19 year old roller coaster starts and he became a 19 year old and, and, you know, had had his ups and downs and inconsistence and uh, going into this year, you know, that was part of my job was to, to build depth. Um, and when he came into camp, Simone Nemich, obviously because of the injury of Dougie, we just thought it's a no brainer. He's going to, he's going to be in our top six. And when you have, when you have a, a, a Hamilton, a Pesci, and a Nemitz, you're like, wow, that's pretty good right side. I'll match that up to any right side in the, in the NHL. And then lo and behold, a guy like Kovacevic comes in and there's an opportunity because Pesci's out. And man, he just he knocked that door down. And uh, he, him and Siegenthal, Siegenthal right now are one of the best pairs in the, in the league. But it started with Dougie's injury last year. And you can't replace him. But it gave us a sneak peek of Nemich and what we had coming. So it was a lot of good. There's a lot of good. And even taken further, you know, with Pesci out in the way uh, Seamus Casey came into training camp this year, another right shot defenseman, uh, different than those other guys. But he came in, it, he was he was really good. So the coach said, like, we can't send him down. Can he play the left? Because of how many right shots we had. And he opened the season as uh, a left defenseman and, and played really well. But, you know, when Pesci and, and, and Luke came back, it just gave us incredible depth and the right place for Seamus was in the American Hockey League. And that's where Simon is right now, um, honing in on his skills because sitting isn't, uh, it wasn't an option up here. You've got also a lot of depth going on up front with, of course, Jack Hughes and Meyer and Jesper Bratt. And I want to ask specifically, though, about the growth and the maturity that you have seen in your captain. Nico Heeshear, who two years ago had a career high this year, uh, was the first player in the NHL to get to 10 goals. And it just seems that he's maturing along with the rest of this club to take that next step. You're right. I mean, what, he's, is this his eighth year? I don't even know what year it is for him. Yeah, eighth, because eighth, it's my 10th, and he came in two years later. Uh, it's, yeah, he's really taken a, a huge step. When I named him captain, I knew that there was going to be a, some growing pains um, with that, with the letter. You know, wearing a letter myself, um, there's there's a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of overthinking things yes. versus being natural and understanding the role. Um, you know, being an extension to the coaching staff. I some lead by example, some lead by you know being vocal and. Nico has really grown into it, and the respect that he has uh, for from his teammates is incredibly high. I, I look at Jack the way he looks at Nico. Um, he, he just he looks at him like a, a, a big brother that he just idolizes, um, and that's that's something special uh, that we have going on. We're very lucky to have have those two in our organization leading us up front, especially through the middle of the ice. But he's really he's really come on strong and understands who he is as a leader, um, but supporting him as well. You know, when I look back at my times, I've talked to Nico a lot about this. It's like you can't put the entire team or burden on your shoulders because you wear the letter. And, and, and it could be anything. It could be the social side of it. It could be the PA side of it, making sure yeah, you know, it could be what are we doing for, for lunch tomorrow, dinner? Today? Like it just it can really get nitpicky and it's like you need help let someone else make those decisions you don't need to do that and you know, when you bring an Andre Pallad in and you bring a Brendan Dillon and you bring a Steph Nason in, these guys who who lead by example they, they've taken a lot off Nico's play to allow him just to be the best player he can be and the best version of him as our leader and, and he's done that and it's uh it's it's been a it's been quite a journey to be honest and, and I'm really proud to 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 be part of it with these guys Tom, a uh, uh, last thing uh, I, I'm going to hit on with you is because I was a GM for so long and went to so many GM meetings uh, over the years. And uh, I, I sometimes had in my head what I wanted to get across uh, as far as the rules or as far as one issue or another issue. Is there anything rather than asking you what you guys are going to talk about? Cause that's boring. Um, is there anything that you'd like to see changed or tweaked or 
uh, in in the league that uh, you know maybe the netting with the replays or stuff like that. No, it's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot of areas. You know, you know this like you, you, you can't. Rome wasn't built in a day, and you can't fix everything all at once. And you know, for me right now, the one of the biggest coin flip or question mark there is is, is goaltender interference. I, I just I I don't get it, and I don't understand. I mean, we put the burden on our, our video coaches. And you know, Jerry Deneen, like this poor guy, he's got to make, oh, I, I, I think this is a, I think that's an interference, but you don't know what the league, I, I think there's so, so, there's too much subjectiveness in it. Yeah, I, I, to be honest with you, I would like the league, if they're watching every play, let them call down and tell us that, sorry, that's an interference versus let our, our, our video coaches come to our system coaches on the bench, say, I think it's, they say it's goalie interference. It's not goalie interference. I just, it's, it's a lot for them. I, I'd like to see us really have a, an in-depth in conversation. I think we will. Um, I think that's probably part of tomorrow. I haven't looked at the agenda yet. I think another thing that teams are going to want to talk about is the, the no stat, no state tax uh, teams and the advantages that they have. I guess if I'm the league, I'd say, well, they were bad at one point. So it's, it's a moot point. Um, but. There isn't there. I think there is an advantage, and I think there 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 has to be some sort of mechanism that could help every other team that are dealing with. And you've dealt with the nail in New York, the state income tax, the city tax. You know, I'm going through it trying to you know convince free agents that oh, it's not that bad. <laughs> like, uh, oh, go buy a place in Florida so you can use that as your permanent resident. Like, there's got to be some way where we all can get on the same even playing field. Um, I would love to say to somebody. You know, taking six million here is like seven and a half up there, you know, and understand the value of, you know, money right now. Um, so just probably two things that I, I, I would like to see if there's solutions for. Um, but we can go on and on. I, I could probably give you a dozen things too. Yeah. Well, you, you just mentioned a name that's near and dear to my heart. And I, 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 I had actually forgotten Jerry was with you guys and he's got to be one of the best kids. And I call him a kid because he was always a kid when I worked with his dad, Bill Deneen. And so I know the whole crew. I, and I knew Pat, the mom. Uh, I, they're wonderful family. Great family. Because he's a great kid. He is. He's a great person. He cares so much about uh, about his, his coaches, his team, his people. He's great. They're great people. Um, and that's what we're trying to add to the organization is I, I don't we want talent, but we want really good people deep down and the, the, the Deneens, uh, they all check that box. That's for sure. That, that is for sure. Well, Hey, Hey Tom, I, I got one more for you before we let you go. And we're going to turn the way back machine on a little bit because I think, you know, everybody knows that the Panthers won the Stanley cup last year and they made the final in 2023. But the first Panthers team to make the cup final was in 1996, and the gentleman who scored the game-winning goal at 6:18 of the third period in Pittsburgh is with us today with a booming slap shot from the blue line, which uh, appeared to glance off Wilkinson's stick and over the shoulder of Tom Barrasso. And just want to know if you know maybe Al McGinnis was ch uh, was checking in with you for tips on that blast of a shot that. You put in in 1996. Yeah, well, that was uh, that was one of those. I'm going to dump it in the change because I was changing. I'm just going to put it on that. And yeah, he, 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 hockey, you know, you get lucky sometimes. Comes off a stick, it goes a different direction. And we were lucky. And I can tell you, the, the, was there six something left in the game? You said uh, you would have thought it, it felt like 24 hours. Like it just went by so slow, and every shift was just like uh, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and. But yeah, it was a great time for, for me. It was one of the defining moments in my career. Um, uh, you didn't have many, but that was one of them. Um, so it was, a, it was a lot of fun. And, and it was the year of the rat. Everything just came together that year. You know, at the start when John, uh, Scott Mellonby killed that rat that ran through our locker room in, in Miami. And, uh, yeah, it was just a, it was a great run. It really was a lot of fun, and those guys were all like, Neil, you you won a cup. I mean, we we lost a cup. I can't imagine, you know, what what that felt like. Um, but for us, it was it was incredible being a third year team, a, a true expansion team. To say not to take yeah. away <laughs> Seattle and, and Vegas, but we were a true expansion. Um, we were we were the we were the misfit toys, right? You know, we were the misfit toys yeah. that pulled together, and yeah, it was it was a great run. 
Well, I gave you guys John Van Beesbrook. Uh, that was my uh, contribution uh, because I I had I could I had to pick between Mike Richter and John Van Beesbrook, and I picked Richter uh, because we could only protect one. It was crazy, and, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a, it was a crazy time. And, uh, Tommy, thank you for coming on here and doing that. This is great. I mean, I, I just, just, I, I love being able to get the, the GMs on and be able to talk about the stuff that usually doesn't get talked about. And, and, uh, uh, I'm really impressed with the job you did this off season. I really am to, to shore your club up. And Vic and I have talked about it a lot and, and, uh, I hope you guys keep it going and do great things this year. I appreciate it, guys. It's always a pleasure. And, you know, taking a peek behind the, the curtain is, I think it's important for, for people to, to understand the decisions we have to make as managers and how we get to those decisions. And no, it's, it's been great. So I appreciate it. Appreciate the comments and, and compliments. So it was my pleasure, guys. Take care. Thank you. Good luck. And Neil, what a terrific guest Tom uh, Fitzgerald was. And uh, before we move forward, a reminder to folks that our website is NHLWraparound.com. And we will be back on Wednesday with our short shifts, which appear every Wednesday and Friday and a great bridge between the regular wraparound shows. So some league notes, Neil. And uh, first thing we're going to do is hit some goaltenders. John Gibson returned for the Anaheim Ducks on Sunday. Uh, had an appendectomy late in training camp. He makes 40 saves in a return win against Columbus. And Jeremy Swayman and Linus Allmark reunited for the first time uh, since Allmark was traded to the Ottawa Senators and Ottawa winning in overtime. But before the game, they had a big hug, the whole pose. And, you know, I just got to wonder, before we hit the last goaltending item, what were the teams of the 50s would have said with players hugging each other, because these are teams that traveled by train. Usually they had to have a car between them so that they wouldn't brawl in between games of their home and home series. Yeah. Well, it, we, you know what? You don't even have to go back that far. Just go back to the nineties when, when I was running the teams and uh, the coaches didn't like you talking to the opposition. Like if you, if you smiled during warm up or, or said something, they'd be pissed at you for like, you're not taking it seriously enough. So times change, I guess. I guess they do. In Pittsburgh, Tristan Jerry has been recalled from Wilkes-Barre Scranton, had a pretty good record of 4-1-0, 2.16 goals against average, 926 save percentage, as he now tries to turn his season around. This is a significant move for the Penguins. Yeah, it is. They got to get that uh, goaltending situation straightened out. Uh, they, they need a lot of things straightened out, but goaltending obviously is the backbone of every team, and um, they're going to have to get their – have to see what Jerry can do now. If he is he back? Is he back to playing the way he can play, or is he still nervous and going to let pucks in? Head on to some other player news right now. Tanner Janot suspended for three games for his hit on Brock Besser, and Besser is now out indefinitely. Also, news on Monday: Max Pacioretty out week to week. He was cross checked by uh, Matheson on Montreal. He has a lower body injury. And Austin Matthews, who there was talk may come back on Tuesday, did not practice on Monday. So a little bit of injury concern there. But certainly in the case of Matthews, Neil, why rush him? The team is playing very well without him. And this is almost another situation that we saw with Connor McDavid, that a team manages to galvanize when their superstar is out because they realize that that star is not there to carry them. Exactly. And that, that you just said it. I mean, they all pull up their bootstraps and go to work. And, uh, you know, they're not sitting back waiting for, um, you know, number 34 to do what he does and win the game for them. They're, they're in there having to work even harder than they normally work. So, um, and, and with both, uh, Pacioretty has, has fit in well on the Leafs. So he's, he's a loss to them, him being out. And, and of course, Matthews is a huge hole, but, uh, they are playing really well. Um, they seem like they've got the, the good goaltender now in Stolars. So we'll see what happens. But poor Patch already. I mean, he has had so many injuries to deal with over the years. This is just another one piling on. 
So hopefully uh, he gets back sooner than later. Other player moves, Dante Fabro waived by Nashville, claimed by Columbus. Uh, Daniel Strong, uh, Sprong was uh, traded from the Vancouver Canucks to the Seattle Kraken, where he will have his second stint with the Kraken. And the 15th overall pick by the Canucks in 2022, Jonathan LeCaramacki was uh, called up. He was the Swedish Rookie of the Year in 2024. So that should augment their offense just uh, a little bit more. A couple of games that we looked at on Saturday that we talked about on Friday on short shifts. Uh, the Canucks played the Edmonton Oilers, and Edmonton got out to a 3 nothing lead. The Canucks came back with two, and I settled in for the third period thinking this is going to be one hell of a third period. And the Oilers really flex a muscle on uh, Kevin Lankinen scoring four in a 455 period of the third period to blow that game open and route to a 7-3 victory. And also chase Lankin and out of the net. Uh, they, he was pulled right after that. So, yeah, that's the thing with the Oilers, boy. Uh, yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're a little bit confusing because you really don't know what you're going to get when you tune the game on, do you? Like, you don't know, are they, are they going to are they going to be that oiler team that went to game seven of the final? Are they going to, you know, get, get behind and then come back and blow the team out in the third? I mean, you, you, you just don't know what to expect out of Edmonton, but you do know you're going to get an entertaining game. That's for sure. Well, also entertaining on Saturday evening was the Colorado Avalanche and Carolina came in riding an eight game winning streak. Took a 2 nothing lead in the second period, and oh, here come the Avalanche. Five different goal scorers within a 9.36 span in the second period, turned a 2 nothing deficit into a 5-3 lead and route to a 6-4 to win. And right now, Devon Taves has come back. Uh, they may get Chushkin back this weekend. So this rough start for the Avalanche may be in the rearview mirror a little bit sooner than we thought. It may be. The the only thing is Georgiev has got to have to keep his play going like it's been as of late and not how it was as of early. He's still got a horrific uh, goals against average and a horrific save percentage because of the way that the club started this season. So they got to get that. Uh, also in line, but the, with these guys coming back, particularly Nikushkin and Devon Taves is, is a real solid defenseman for them. Um, they're, they're, they're going to be right back in it again. They're, right now they are on the outside looking in. They won't be there for long. No. And let's not forget, uh, Terry Lekinen also returning from injury and that has helped as well. So you like steak? Yeah, I do. Yeah, well, all right, because we're going to talk sizzle, but no steak <laughs> in this particular segment. And during our summer coolers, uh, we had to talk about Trevor Zegris of the Anaheim Ducks and how I'd refer to him as probably the ultimate sizzle and no steak player in the league. Of course, meaning that there's a lot of flair. But there's not a lot of production, but we wanted to wait and see how the season started. And now I think I'm ready to step forward and back that up, saying that I think that we're right on this. Because thus far this season, a goal, two assists in the first 14 games, that goal was into an empty net. So right now, Philip Gustafson has also accomplished that as the goaltender of the Minnesota Wild. Zegers is getting over 17 minutes of ice time a game. He's playing on the second line. He's getting power play time. He's still not producing. He's a perimeter player, only 40% on faceoffs. And of his 26 shots on goal, now think of this, 26 shots, less than two per game as the number two center. Only six of those have come from the dirty areas in front of the net. So, when I circle back here, I still maintain, Neil, the worst thing that happened to Zegris was the three Michigan goals three years ago, the alley-oop where he was behind the Buffalo net, flipped it over the net, and Sonny Milano batted it in, and he be had this just flair attached to him. And this is what he is now identified with, those four particular goals, but very little production since. Yeah, very little production. And you know what? You, you, 
if the puck doesn't end up in the net, it doesn't matter how many great things you do on the ice. You've got to get the pucks into the net so that at the end of the game, the number underneath your city is larger than the number underneath the other city on the scoreboard. So, uh, you know, Zegris, I get a feeling, and maybe I'm wrong, but I get a feeling that they're trying to somewhat subliminally market this guy. I noticed that in their last game, he was second star of the game. And I thought, oh, well, he must have had a real good game. It was a late game, so I didn't see it. So I went back and looked at the stats. He had no goals, no assists, had like one shot on net, and he was second star of the game. Now, I'm not saying that the club controls who the stars are, but I'm sort of saying they could be whispering who they wish the stars would be so that – um you know, perhaps he would be more marketable. Uh, it, it wouldn't be the first time that's been done by a team that they say to the uh, TV people, the radio people, and the people picking the stars, hey, how about if you make Trevor the second star tonight? Could you do that? That might help me. So we'll see. We'll see. I, I He's certainly not a Pat Verbeek type of player. Correct. Pat Verbeek, yeah. who led the league, didn't he one year, Pat Verbeek led the league in goals and in penalty minutes or fighting majors or something? Yeah, I mean, he he was a gnarly player oh, and, and not a big guy. Uh, and Zegers is certainly not a big guy either. But, you know, like you said, uh, this the, the GM, the, a very different player than Trevor Zegers is. Yes, that's uh, for sure. I had I had Pat Verbeek on the Rangers for a couple of years, and he is a uh, little ball of hate. They used to say, "Yeah," and Zegers is anything but that. I mean, great personality, you know, wonderful persona. But I watched that game last night just to see if I would actually notice him, and if I wasn't looking for him to actually see what his contributions were on the ice. Besides, he had a decent night in the faceoff circle. I wouldn't have noticed him. And that's the problem is you want to notice these players. And in the case of Zegers, you just don't notice him enough. And the NHL so, uh, as a league has promoted Zegers on many different occasions on their billboards and, and, and artwork that they do about the up and coming young players. They've got them in there with the McDavid's and the Matthews's and the, uh, the, the real top guy. So uh, that'll all come to a screeching halt if he doesn't get some numbers going. Very true. Very true. I'm going to move over now to a little bit of college news. And this is pretty significant. And I think you can explain this far better than I ever could. The NCAA has lifted its eligibility ban on Canadian Hockey League players to play in U.S. colleges. And just want for you to capitalize, what are the benefits for the U.S., which I think are fairly obvious, but are there any benefits going back to the Canadian juniors? And just want to remind people, this is for Division One only, not for Division Three. But, Neil, perhaps you can unpack this a little bit for us. Yeah, the, the ruling had always been, well, when I say always, back to the days when I was in junior, so we're talking about back to the 70s, that uh, if you played major junior hockey, you were ineligible to get a scholarship and play in the NCAA. Uh, and, the, you know, I remember the exact case way back when. So it's always been that way. It sort of was looked on by the NCAA as if you're playing in junior, you're, you're sort of a pro and pros weren't uh, allowed to, to into the NCAA. Well, now changing that and saying, well, if you've played major junior, you can still get a scholarship and play in the NCAA. That opens up all these players to NCAA teams that they could recruit. Um, perhaps if you got drafted real late in the draft, if you're playing major junior and decide, well, I, I really want to get a, a U- U.S. college education. I'm going to go off. I'm going to st- stop right here um, in my mid junior career and I'm going to go off to college now because um, I just think that's a better place for me to go. And I don't know how it's going to help Canadian major junior because they don't have a place to go and take players from. They, they've just got the same way that it always was, which is mostly Canadian players. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's going to be very interesting. I mean, it's going to be overwhelming for college coaches and their assistant coaches how many teams are going to have to scout now? If you take into consideration, you've got to scout all these U.S. junior leagues. Then you've got to scout the uh, Western Hockey League, the Ontario Hockey League, and the Quebec Hockey League. 
all of these leagues, you got to scout for players that might want to come and play on your college team. Um, it's going to be a lot of work. And, and again, as you asked, what's the upside for the junior leagues? I don't think there is any. And clearly, this is absolutely a watershed moment because for how many decades since, you know, the, the, throughout the history of hockey, has Canada been known as the bloodline of the sport to the National Hockey League? And of course, we've seen the influx of Americans and Europeans. And this, uh, you know, this, this is certainly uh, an example of how times have changed. Oh, they, well, they are a change, and that's for sure. When you're playing uh, college players that are getting a free education and now you're paying them for their name and likeness, uh, things are really changing. This is the human side of the story. And on Monday, the Hall of Fame welcomes the class of 2024 for induction from the NHL, Pavel Datsuk, Jeremy Roenick, and Shea Weber, and from the U.S. women's program, highly decorated Natalie Darwitz and Chrissy Wendell Paul. And from the builders category, we have longtime general manager David Poyle, served 40 years as a GM for the uh, Washington Capitals and Nashville Predators, and a man who served 52 years in hockey as a player, coach, executive, and you know him best, Neil, from being behind the bench with Mike Keenan for your Stanley Cup in 1994, and that is Colin Campbell. Yeah, and I just want to speak about these two guys. First, about David Poyle. I competed against David Poyle for many years, both when I was with Detroit and he was with the Washington Capitals. Uh, way back started in uh, 1982. He's the son of uh, coach, NHL player, NHL coach, and NHL executive Bud Poyle. Uh, so the, the hockey runs in the family. Uh, uh, Poyle is, of course, going in. David is going in this year into the Hockey Hall of Fame. He was a pretty good college player at Northeastern University. He still has the most hat tricks in their in that university's history with 11. Um, he joined the Atlanta Flames when they first came into the league in 1972. They came in with the Islanders, and he was there in the administration. And then he was named as... Um, assistant GM of, of the Atlanta Flames in 1977. As I said, in 82, he went to Washington uh, to be the GM of the Washington Capitals, stayed there for 15 years. And he was succeeded, of course, by George McPhee. He um, went on to the National Predators in 1997. And up until this recent change to Barry Trotz, he's the only general manager the Nashville Predators had ever had. And he was also general manager of the 98 and 99 U.S. national team. And one of the most interesting but sad things for David is that uh, in 1997, he was at uh, the uh, pregame skate for the for the Predators outside of the arena, outside of the glass and the boards, and a puck came over and hit him in the right eye, and he's never been able to see out of that eye ever since. And that really strange, that uh, injury uh, to the general manager, and, and really sad for David to have had that uh, misfortune. Uh, Colin Campbell, who I'm very near and dear to, I worked with him both in in, in Detroit. Uh, uh, at, he was a defenseman for us on the Red Wings. He was uh, assistant coach for uh, a number of years, and then he came over uh, to the Rangers when I was there and I was assistant coach um, there for, for a number of years up till 94 when we won the Cup, and then uh, I made him the head coach when Mike Keenan left and went to St. Louis, and Coley did a very good job, uh, a great job as an assistant coach and uh, a, a really good job, in my opinion, while he was head coach and including getting the 1997 team all the way to the semifinal against Philadelphia, having knocked out Florida and New Jersey before that. He played 636 NHL games, so he was a pretty good player. He was a... Uh, uh, a small player for his time, only at five foot nine. That was tiny for defensemen back in those days. And, uh, he, but he had, a, he had a great career. Another Peterborough Pete, of course, who had, uh, learned under Roger Nielsen. Uh, but Coley Campbell is, um, 
iconic in the hockey world. He's he's done just about everything you can do, and uh, I'm very proud that uh, I'm I'm friends with Coley and his wife and his family, and of course he's his son Gregory Campbell has two Stanley Cups to his credit. One that he won as a player with the Boston Bruins, and then just last year winning as assistant GM of the Florida Panthers. So um, again, hockey continues in the family. It certainly does. And I just remember Coley Campbell as a player and playing for Vancouver with the big cannonball helmet. So uh, certainly a great job by all five. Congratulations for each of them getting into actually all seven, each of them getting into the Hockey Hall of Fame. But as we celebrate seven new members of the hall, there are also those that have been overlooked over the years. And probably at the top of the list in the player category is Alexander McGillney, who has been passed over 15 years, a career that had 473 goals, 1,032 points, highlighted by 76 goals and 127 points during the 92-93 season. He defected during the 1989 World Championships, and yet he is still one of only 12 players with quadruple gold. That's World Junior Championships, World Championships, Olympic gold, and a Stanley Cup. And by all accounts, all metrics, everything that analysts look at, this is a player that absolutely should be in the Hall of Fame, Neil. Uh, I, he was a dominant player. I, I remember him and Lafontaine getting together so much in Buffalo. They were so dynamic. Uh, he he was just an awesome player. I saw him right from when he played in the World Junior with uh, Pavel Pavel Bure and Sergei Fedorov. Imagine those three were all on the Russian Junior team. That's in the days when Mike Madonna was on the USA uh, Junior team. So and that it, it took place in um, Alaska. Uh, it's, but anyway, I, I defer. Uh, he should be in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Alexander McGillney, as you said, by every metrics possible. Uh, I, who knows why he's not. And there's an 18 member committee made up of players, coaches, executives, and media that decide on the nominations and the elections to the Hockey Hall of Fame. But whatever the criteria is, it is somewhat secretive in that it's almost like a conclave. And I did see that movie this past weekend where the Cardinals are invited to Rome and under great secrecy, they nominate and then they eventually elect to do Pope. And it almost seems that this is a similar situation here. And as we've just touched on McGillney, I also want to touch on you for a second, Neil, because though you are best known for being the general manager in New York to end the 54-year-old drought for the Rangers in 1994. In reality, your fingerprints are on three different franchises that have won championships, the first of which the New York Islanders, and you were an advanced scout for Al Arbor, and you have Stanley Cup rings uh, for the 1981 and 82 championship seasons. And then when you left to become the director of scouting in Detroit, You selected Steve Eisenman in 1983 with the fourth overall pick. And then in 89, you hit this crown jewel with three players, Nick Lidstrom, Sergei Fedorov, Vlad Konstantinov. And those players were all part of the Stanley Cup championship teams. Obviously, not all of them for all four, but the lineage does go from 1997, 1998, 2002 and 2008 when Lidstrom captained that last Red Wings Stanley Cup team. In addition to that, there were some other things that you did that were pretty notable. And once you moved to New York in your first season, the uh, 1989-90 season in New York, the Rangers won the Patrick division in the regular season and they had not won a division title since 1942. You drafted. Sergei Zuboff, Hall of Famer, uh, Sergei Nemchinov, Alexei Kovalev, the first ever Russian drafted in the first round in 1991. And along with Alexander Karpatsev, those were the first Russian players ever to win the Stanley Cup. 
You made notable trades. You got Mark Messier and Jeff Bukaboom out of Vancouver. They were uh, out of Edmonton, rather. They were Stanley Cup champions. You signed Adam Graves, who you had actually drafted in 1986. He had a 52 goal season that year that the Rangers won the Stanley Cup. Twice you were executive of the year in 1992 and 1994, and a three time Calder Cup winner overseeing Adirondack in 1986 and 1989, and the Hartford Wolfpack in 2000. So, in closing, all I have to say is over the last 20 years, I wish that the Toronto Maple Leafs had given you that GM title because had they done so, I don't think that we would be talking about 58 years, 58 seasons since the Leafs last cup in 1967. Well, I would have loved that opportunity, Vic. And I remember back then my mom uh, was still alive and she's a Torontonian and uh, it would have been a great thrill for her, but it wasn't meant to be. And, um, you know, life goes on and uh, I got I got many blessings in my life, but uh, we'll see if uh, someday the Hockey Hall of Fame is one of them. Who knows? And that wraps up this edition of NHL Wraparound. Many thanks to New Jersey Devils General Manager and President of Hockey Operations, Tom Fitzgerald, for joining us. Thank you to our listeners. Reach out to us at NHLWraparound at gmail.com. And our website is NHLWraparound.com. And also remember, Neil and I will be back on Wednesday with our short shifts with more immediate and in-depth coverage from around the NHL. So until then, on behalf of Neil, I'm Vic, and we will speak to you Wednesday. Thanks for joining us on the NHL Wraparound Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date on all the NHL action.